welcome to Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts Untold Stories, a conversation with artists Carletta Carrington Wilson and Eileen Jimenez. I'm Amy Sawyer, associate curator and the co-curator with the chief cur curator Greg Robinson of the exhibition titled Breathe. It is an honor to welcome our guest and we thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that each one of us are gathered here is uh, located on unceded indigenous lands. The Bainbridge Island Museum of Art is situated on the ancestral lands of the Suquamish peoples, expert fishers, canoe builders, basket weavers, Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Seas as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish live and protect the waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. BIMA aims to create a culture of inclusion with respect for who is telling the story and whose story is being told. And we aspire to help build a more equitable world fight against systemic racism and stand in solidarity with all who fight for justice. Bima's inaugural and told story series is an online festival of lectures and panels and conversations which will hopefully inspire, empower, and educate through the art of storytelling. Untold Stories brings to light the histories, ideas, and perspectives that have gone unrecognized or have been forgotten. And we are grateful to our donors for the generosity of our members and as well as the PRISM Fund for making this premiere of what we hope will uh, be an ongoing series of untold stories possible. So you can stay informed uh, at our upcoming events on our website at biartmuseum.org and other social media under the same name. All right. It is an honor to be gathering in the Zoom world. <laughs> so this goes without saying, please be respectful and compassionate and when submitting uh, comments or questions in the chat bubble this uh, evening, we, I mean, we will be taking questions this evening at the end. So um, your, the Q&A will be at the end. Please hold your questions and comments until the end. Um, and the Q&A bubble is at the bottom of the screen. Breathe is a group exhibition inspired by the legacy of, the, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and um, embraces themes of racial equity and social justice, focusing on reflections on nature and even beauty for beauty's sake. It's an honor to highlight the work of two artists featured in the show. And we'll be going through some of the work uh, featured in, in their exhibition. Um, it's a group show. And both of the artists here tonight, Carletta Carrington Wilson and Eileen Jimenez, are there. They share this critical focus that's really pivotal during this season, I, I think, of reckoning in America. So, thank you both for being willing to talk about your art and your identities. And, um, let me just click through here and I am just so glad I get to know the both of you and to share the, the work that you do, some of it, you know, in this time. And, um, you know, this to, just to talk about it, it continues to help us define and I 
think in a way that's what, what is liberation and what is empathy and, and how art can reveal to us, you know, the yes and moments and uh, through, through deep lis listening. All right. Um, thank you. Fun screen. All right. Let me go. Sorry. <clears throat> so um, Eileen Jimenez is a printmaker and educator based in Seattle whose work has been featured in the Seattle Print Arts and Davidson Galleries exhibition recently that in August 2020 is a Contemporary Northwest Print Invitational and is a member of the Ye Yehao Collective on Indigenous-led projects that include a satellite installation or satellite installations, performances and workshops and trainings and artists and residents, art markets, publications and partner events at more than 25 sites across the Coast Salish territories and beyond. Eileen is influenced by her uh, many intersecting identities and lived experiences. And she was born in Southern California in an art-filled home where she describes how she always wanted to create the art that she wished she would have seen and had access to as a young girl. Um, Eileen's art and leadership is grounded in her community, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about, and the aesthetics of her Mexican and Otomi her heritage, as she says, punctuated by Franco-European and queer influences is the visual representation of, of Eileen's story. So real quick, like when I first saw Eileen's art, I was immediately struck by the colors, the words, and the portraits of how, how she portrays people, not just uh, famous people, but her family um, who inspire and lead her. And um, Eileen, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm going to click to the video, and I was wondering if I can just click through some of the work. And you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and walk us through some of the work that's been featured in the, the Breathe exhibition. Are you on mute? Yes. OK, so I can get started. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, it feels a little bizarre that it's over Zoom, but I, I'm so uh, glad to, to be able to share a little bit about myself and my work with you. Um, like Amy said, I'm a, a queer indigenous printmaker. Um, I live in West Seattle. Um, I learned printmaking at Pratt. So about two years ago, I was gifted a printmaking class. Um, and when I started to do printmaking, I felt like something inside of me clicked, like everything made sense. I felt like it, um, I know that sounds <laughs> really cheesy and a little dramatic, but I felt like I, I finally felt like I found something that helped me be outside of myself because um, I spent a lot of time inside of myself, right? So inward. Um, but I, you know, have been working on printmaking for the last two years, um, and I'm excited to continue to do this. Like, it feels like something I want to continue to do, but um, in my work, you see a representation of, um, of people, of the places, and things that I love. Um, this piece is uh, my grandmother at the top, my mother in the middle, and myself in the bottom. Um, and I titled it Otom Otomi Matriarchs, right? So um, the three generations. Um, and you also see a lot of words in my work. Um, in my culture, um, words or dichos, they're like sayings that um, are, that's how we learn lessons, right? So I remember um, this one is, nos quisieron enterrar, pero no sabían que eramos semillas. So they tried to bury us and they didn't, they didn't know they were seeds, right? So that's a Mexican proverb. But I remember I was with my with my aunt recently and over she she made these like um 
tacos de papa. So it's like we like fried um, uh, potato tacos. And over the breakfast table, she was telling me she she used this Emiliano Zapata um, quote. It's, um, the land belongs to those who work it, right? So just casually over breakfast. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in my culture and in my family, words are how, how we learn lessons. Um, that's how our, our elders share their wisdom with us. Um, so, you know, my grandmother wouldn't just say, you have it so easy or, you know, <laughs> you uh, your life looks different than, than mine did. She would share, um, a story about how when she was growing up, she was responsible for making lunch for her for her dad who worked at um, a field, for example. And every day she woke up at 4 a.m. and worked and made his food and walked miles to go take it to him, right? So the lesson was, <laughs> well, you have it so much easier than, than I did and this is how you care for your family and things like that, right? But it's through stories um, that she did that with. And um, you also see um, the prominence of hands, right? Um, and hands are the embodiment of, of ourselves, right? That's um, what I was taught also, and a representation of our work um, and what we can do and accomplish, right? And so I think a lot about my mother's hands. There are a lot of my pieces are, are titled that way. So something, some of them are titled like Lo Sagrado, so the sacred, my mother's hands. Las manos de mi madre. And um, I think about her hands and my grandmother's hands a lot um, and how callous they were and how wrinkled they were. <laughs> and, you know, I think about um, the stories and the lessons in that, right? So like my mother's calluses held her journey crossing the border, for example, or the years she spent working in strawberry fields when she first came here, right? So, um, or like the love, so both pain and love, right? So the love that I felt when I felt her hands on my skin or, you know, through her hugs or braiding my hair um, or, you know, holding the books that she read to me. Um, and so you see that reflected in my work. Um, and this is the piece that Amy was referring to with, with Yi Hao. Um, and I, it feels a little surreal. This this piece is I, it's at the Fremont Abbey out, outside of their building, but it's also been featured um, in skyscrapers in New York and London. And it feels really surreal. But this is um, a really cool story. The story of how um, translates to "Together We Lift the Sky," um, and it's a story I heard by uh, Roger Fernandez. Um, share when I first moved to Seattle about how you how is this word that can kind of connect us all so even if we speak different languages if we don't understand right but if we work together um, this this word that is uh, made up right you how trans translates to together we lift the sky which means if we work together we can lift this this sky right um, but um, yeah, I think I also wanted to share that, you know, in my work, you also see a lot of, you know, handmade papers. So this one is um, Amate paper. So it's uh, traditionally made by Otomi people. So from, from my indigenous group, but um, it, you know, a lot of these papers, I bought them um, in on my travels um, to different places. Um, and in some ways that feels, it feels like the places I visited, I always try to swim in water of those places. Um, water feels really sacred to me, but um, somehow that, that place becomes a part of me. And by adding these papers that are made by, by these people in these places, um, it feels like a really cool and, um, I don't know, out of body way of in incorporating these, these places that are now part of my story in my work as well. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, we're gonna ask more questions as um, we continue. And I just wanna introduce now, uh, Carletta Carrington Wilson is a visual and literary artist based in Seattle. 
as well. And Carletta's work has been ex exhibited at COCA and at Elizabeth C. Miller Horticulture Library and Art Exchange Gallery, Northwest African American Museum, uh, the Washington State Convention Center and Onyx Fine Arts Exhibitions, uh, as well as the University of Washington, many places, libraries, and at, um, I had the pleasure of working a little bit with Carletta in 2018 um, for an, a large-scale exhibition of our, the artist book collection, uh, our founder's artist book collection at BIMA, and Carletta was installed a large-scale work titled Letter to Alondras. And also, Carlos' work can be found in all different collections, the University of Washington, Allen Library Book Art Collection, and at University of Puget Sound, Collins Memorial Library, and Book Arts and Private Press Collection, the Judith A. Hoffberg Collection of Artist Books at UCLA. And she is a member of the Onyx Fine Arts Collective and Puget Sound Book Artist. Carletta, um, much of your work pulls out a hidden history and also a, a hidden trauma and of, of our country, the story. And um, when you look back, you really bring that forward. And I, I was wondering if you could talk more about yourself and um, the series Field Notes, which is in the, the um, Breathe exhibition at BEMA. Thanks again for being here. Great. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate the opportunity to exhibit once again at BIMA. I also thank everyone for coming, for your time and your attention. Um, I will begin uh, with two quotes. That in any slave state, a field hand should learn to read is remarkable. Frederick Douglass. The second quote is the Virginia Revised Code of 1819. That all meetings or assemblages of slaves or free Negroes or mulattoes mixing and associating with such slaves at any meeting house or houses, et cetera, in the night or at any school or schools for teaching them reading or writing, either in the day or night under whatsoever pretext shall be deemed and considered an unlawful assembly. And any justice of a county and et cetera, wherein such assemblage shall be either from his own knowledge or the information of others of such unlawful assemblage, et cetera, may issue his warrant directed to any sworn office, officer or officers, authorizing him or them to enter the house or houses where such unlawful assemblages, et cetera, may be for the purpose of apprehending or dispersing such slaves and to inflict corporal punishment on the offender or offenders at the discretion of the justice of the peace, not exceeding 20 lashes. That is from the American Slave Code. For those of you who may not know, many states, slave holding states, had their own slave uh, slave codes. Basically, they read the same. And uh, so during enslavement, it was against the law for any enslaved person to read or write. Twisted and knotted paper lines constitute a unique form of correspondence in the series field notes. Each letter-sized collage's message is signed with an X, the universal signature of an illiterate person. Unlike those who labored in close proximity to masters and mistresses, field hands would not handle, hand over 
or handle newspapers, letters, books, diaries, or even journals. They did not witness children learning to read and write. Upon emancipation, learning to read and write became paramount for the formerly enslaved. That string of knotty lines, that threaded trail pointed to the possibility of unimaginable freedoms. Comprehending the spell cast by letters could only enable a person to further dispel the conditions created by dint of their enslavement. Language is a visual medium, one by which form, shape, and color inform an eye and shape a mind. Through the lens of history, I visit and revisit the role language has played in the creation of a past and the scripting of its future. My work is an exploration of the text of textiles. The works and field notes reconstruct the field as a landscape of literature. It's rows written upon by hands mapping a place of ancestral memory in code. 12 collages represent an agricultural year as well as the number of enslaved generations. The impetus for this work came about as I wondered, how did they do it? Survive, survive centuries of murders, maimings, rapes and ruptures of family and friend, of place, out of place, in place, you better know your place. Well, they couldn't take away a rainbow, the magic moods of a sky, music of bird song and the blooming budding that returned again, 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 say it 12 times. Life goes on in spite of treachery. Life goes on at the edges of a society hell bent on denial. Twisted and knotted lines mirror the format of a letter. Well, note their brevity. Immersed they are by the splendor of land, a countryside that is counterpoint to every deprivation visited upon them. Completed in 2014, I was never satisfied with the original titles. They felt contrived and they were. I didn't know what I was doing. I was frustrated by their banality. When I was invited to exhibit this series at BEMA, I had to take a second look. And so I combed the slave narratives. This brought new meaning to this work. I no longer had to wonder or imagine what they would have written if they had the skill, the luxury of knowing the wor world of words. These new titles fill these works with breath, B-R-E-A-D-T-H, for they carry the breath, come out of the mouth of a slave who worked the land a land consumed by cotton. Thank you. Thank you. It's powerful work and history and story and stories that I'm just so honored to be able to listen tonight. Um, both of your artwork intersects in not just the visual, but in a literary way, like in this format that we're um, so 
grateful to be able to see and hear tonight. Um, throughout history, it is the word and the image that's been used to either dehumanize or humanize. Would um, either of you be willing to speak uh, to the humanization and of your art a little bit more and why that is important? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, I think, you know, I, gr growing up, I think about the art that I saw um, and the portraits that I saw, you know, I thought, um, you know, like the, the presidential portraits or the regal portraits or the read posters even that I saw in my, in my library. Um, and I used to think that only rich white regal people and really exceptional people of color deserve to have their art um, and their portraits painted and um, their arts displayed, right? So the artists that I learned about, Picasso and Van Gogh, right? Um, and even Frida, right? Like the, the, the few uh, people of color um, who, who, who are shared um, in our educational system and in our society. Um, but I, you know, I had never seen people who looked like my mom or like myself. Um, I had never seen anything in another language. Um, and, you know, I, again, thinking about the way that, that white supremacy informs that, right? And thinking about how white supremacy tells us what's acceptable and what deserves um, to be shown and perpetuated and things like that. Um, but I think in, in my art, I'm human, right? So I'm, I'm more myself than any boxes or any terms. I am more than blood quantum, right? In my art, I don't have to explain my indigenous stories, they just are. Um, in my art, you know, you, um, like my, my mom is just is who she is and who she was. Um, my grandmother gets to wear her, her favorite sweater. Um, she gets to wear her, her lanyard that she always wore and it doesn't, it doesn't have to mean anything. It doesn't have to, you know, add to the artistic value. Like that's just who it is. It's just her favorite sweater and her lanyard. And I actually gave my cousins and my, and um, my aunts and uncles copies of, of that portrait. And they, they knew what that lanyard meant, right? And we were all like, oh, I wonder what lanyard she was wearing, <laughs> you know, and thinking about how important that is, is that we, we exist beyond, you know, beyond what we were allowed to be, I think. We just, we, we just are. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, um, it's that inherent belonging that we're, we're all, we all um, want and, and desire. Um, Carletta, um, where do you feel like your personal process of pulling these stories out met? Um, if you're, if you would like to describe at what point your art meets with your, your personal story. Well, it's hard. It's just so tied up, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I can't tell where it meets, it meets all over. I mean, I, I basically, um, well, it's a process of remembering, but remembering what I never knew. So I would say I am meeting history and history is meeting me. I, it's just like, as I looked at the slave narratives through reading those narratives, I come to understand people in my family, what their experience was like, not having that information directly trans given to me through generations, I have to go back and make an assessment about the history experiences and then um, come up with an answer that resonates today. It, it's a disrupting the, the dominant narrative and revealing that 
the history, the humanity, thereby going through that process. That's what I. That's what I hear. Would you agree to that? I, well, I don't even know about. I'm not interested in disrupting the narrative. Actually, I am interested in discovering a narrative that I didn't know existed. And the process of discovery is actually through the work. The work generates um, an awareness. For instance, as I said, the impetus of this series was, how do you survive centuries? I mean, how do all these people su survive these centuries and literally come out of enslavement pretty much with their minds intact. If you really think about the pressures of, of, of not only just being sold away, but you know, witnessing so much um, death and illness and absence. So how do you build your life, build out a life, a future coming out of that? And the answer for me comes through the work. The work then says, well, I don't know if you're a gardener, but if you know, if you work in the, in, in the yard, you see so much, the, the animals, the birds, the sky, and that cannot be taken away from anyone. And that I think, well, you see life, you see life goes on, you see death, you see life, and so, that taught me how someone, how generations, 12 generations of people could have survived enslavement. Eileen, you, you talk about the nature um, points of, from your work and the stories behind that. Um, it seems like a really integral part of how you connect to the stories of your ancestors as well. Um, am I thinking outside of the box there? Oh yeah, that's, um, you know, I think uh, my art is the way that I exist outside of myself. Um, it, um, sometimes I, my, my art tells something that I haven't even told myself yet <laughs> out loud. Right. So I think, um, yeah, it's, and, and I feel like to say that my art is healing feels too basic. It feels too, too, too simple to say it that way. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways, it's, it's visiting something that I know to be true, like inside of myself. Um, sometimes it's, again, telling me something that I, that I haven't, hadn't articulated in any way before, whether it be through an art piece um, or a poem that I wrote along with the art piece. I was um, wanting to ask if, um, why <laughs> this feels like a, not not maybe I shouldn't ask the question, but like why is now a critical moment for art like this for your art? And I I I've, I would love to hear your thoughts on that from either of you or both of you. Why is now a critical moment? Well, I think. All moments are critical for art. I think art is just essential. I mean, all of the arts are essential to life. First of all, we are surrounded by creation of all types, but art is essential for us to persevere. It teaches us things that we never actually, just like Eileen said, we all share that when you're in the creative process, that work is teaching us. And so I think it's essential, whether even you identify as an artist or not, to be involved in some creative process, because that is how we see ourselves through. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because you know I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends who are also artists, and thinking about a lot of them have felt really stunted uh, right now in terms of creating. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because I think for me, it's been the opposite. I think um, spending so much time with myself and my cat 
at home. Um, I been, you know, my my art has transformed in a really interesting way. I think um, we are my my art and you know artists who are creating right now. I think are creating from a place of pain and a place of joy. Um, I think that's why when you see something that's that's in the news or that's happening, you see you know, people creating art with those images and those and those things. Um, I think that's how we connect to each other in these in these moments, right? So I think that's why you see, you know, portraits of Bernie Sanders and his mittens, or you see Amanda Gorman and her beautiful words, right? Um, and you see portraits that celebrate the lives of um, all, you know, our black brothers and sisters who have been killed by police, right? That's why you see portraits of Jacob Blake Right, and I think it's you know thinking about that that concept of like creating something so it exists outside of ourselves, right, and in in some ways in our in our community and in connection to each other. Yeah, right. Through image and and word, we can spark a movement. We can spark empathy, and I am just so grateful to um, be surrounded by art every day in my life as well. I, um, I came across this quote um, the other day uh, from um, President Obama talking about the sense of belonging and how, well, I'll just read it. If that's okay, if you don't mind. I felt like it really spoke, it speaks to this particular thread of this conversation. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., when talking about civil rights and rising out of the scourge of segregation, he would talk about a, a both and approach and not an either or approach. And in believing in the both and in pursuit of social change, we need policy, smart ideas, analysis, and we also need stories and art passion and courage and it just really reminded me of both of your works like it it takes deep work as you said carletta to to hear the stories to find yourself in that place and um i just um i just love both of your approach and, and willingness to talk about this. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that particular statement? Well, I see, I see the process as a process of translation. And it's a visual language um, in which Basically, the artist is the vehicle, the vehicle and the translator. Um, that's all I want to say. Yeah, I feel like I want to like write that down and spend some time reflecting on it. <laughs> but I feel like that that feels like a like a dicho that I would have heard from from someone in my family, like, let this teach you something and think about it. <laughs> yeah. That's really amazing. True. And I, um, I, I hope that those who are attending tonight are, we can all sit and think about it. Let, it, let this work teach us and listen with deep empathy. Um, following the, I'm following the moment I feel like I'm looking at the time and I don't want to <laughs> stop the conversation because I really I love hearing from you both and thank you both so much for for sharing um, is there any uh, upcoming events or anything that you would like to share with those who are um, with us tonight, and then we can take a few comments and questions from here if you feel like that it's a good time to transition. 
Well, I have a show coming up in March at Wanawari. It's um, actually, you know, I it took me a long time, but actually a lot of my work, like with the Letter to the Laundry series, um, field notes, um, it's cited in the late 19th to early 20th, early to mid 20th century. And I find it kind of interesting. When I say as a translator, I mean, it tells me what to do. I don't say this is what we're doing. <laughs> it's like, this is what you're doing. <laughs> so it's interesting because I say that because some, I mean, decades ago, I started collecting these stereotypical images, books on stereotypes. And uh, so the show is called Night of the stereotypes. And it will be at Wanawari uh, opening March 20th through June or July. Wow. Um, and in the chat, um, I put uh, the link to, it's called the Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery. Um, it's a really cool gallery if you haven't been there. It's a community gallery on the edge of White Center and West Seattle. Um, uh, Jake, who, who runs it, usually has community galleries. Last month was like a youth one. This this month's is uh, More Eterno next month, I think. Um, so I'm in the one right now. And then next month, I also have one um, with six other Seattle artists. So it's just a really cool space. Um, there's always a really cool exhibition there. Very cool. Um, Carletta. I have a, a question, comment and question. Um, are, you, are you okay with questions um, from being Yogi? Uh, Carla, thank you for sharing your work with us and your interest in discovering, unearthing, uplifting narratives rather than disrupting dominant cultural ones. Is very, it's very powerful and moving. Makes me think that uh, think that this is an important way to heal from the violence of the white supremac supremacist archive, which has tried to exclude, control, diminish black narratives. That process seems like it would be necessarily ecstatic and also painful. Can you tell us more about the emotional processes you experience alongside or inside of you in your creative processes? I mean, <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question. I've never been asked that. Well, and, and you are absolutely right. Um, it's not the same emotion. There are different emotions. And they don't come on at the onset. The onset is the what I call the assignment which comes by a title. I get a title, letter to a laundress, field notes. And then I go down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out, well, so exactly what that, what does that mean? And so there is just a process of collecting, really collecting fabric. You know, what is the form? What's the other thing is what is the form that I'm going to use? Um, to work through this idea. And so a lot of time, it, it, it's actually, initially it was a very disconcerting feeling because you really don't, I really did not know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was going, how this was going to, you know, reveal itself. And then there comes a point when, let's say, the one of the pieces comes together and I can say, ah, this is, this is, this is the way I'm going. Um, and then from there, it's just a process of following through. Through that, once the pieces really begin to form and what I would say form an identity and then become embedded with meaning that's when I have feelings. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Eileen, I have someone who's asking a comment it's a, saying, Eileen, I followed your art on Instagram for a long time and I love seeing your creative process as it happens. Your art has changed a lot in the past couple of years. What do you think has contributed to this change? Yeah, I think um, I'm really active on 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 Instagram, and I uh, so I, I think that's uh, I post a lot about my my process. Sometimes my bloopers, right? So like when I mess up a uh, lino cut or something. Um, but I think it has changed a lot. I, I'm actually really shocked, you know, two years ago when I started Lino Cut and printmaking, it looks so different. Um, I think it, it has to do a lot with, with, with therapy, actually. Um, I have been going to therapy for the last couple of years. Um, and I think that has opened up. So the things that guide my work is like things that I've explored in therapy, right? And so it's interesting how aligned it is to it. Um, whether it's a poem or like I said, like an art piece. Um, but I really do think is that I, the art that I'm creating has changed as I have changed. So like, it feels like I'm more authentically myself. Um, and I think I also used to be, when I first started, I was, I, I used to compare myself a lot to a lot of artists. Like, I wish I could make lines like that, or I wish I could do this. Um, I didn't go to art school, so I don't know I actually don't know a lot of the proper terms in printmaking or what are things that you do in printmaking or don't do. But I, I think that actually now I've embraced that in some ways is that I don't actually really care, um, which I'm sure people who are like, is like, you know, in love with editioning and all that stuff, I feel like I would probably in, insult them. But I don't, you know, I, I don't know how to edition prints. And I think I'm okay with that. Um, and in, 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 in a lot of ways, like I said, my art exists outside of the um, colonized ways that art exists. So um, I don't know what else the question is. I think that was it. I think that you, yeah, sort of that I wanted to the, uh, ask both of you on the question, what advice do you have for developing artists who want to deepen their craft as well as getting their art out? in public yeah and, and and i think you know connecting with other people like actually my friends and i here in seattle we have a lino cut night school so we just are all self self-taught artists and we, we just were like we're gonna teach ourselves reduction printing this week so we all uh try a reduction print and one of my my first reduction print was the one that was featured at davidson galleries actually so it's really cool to just be like we're just gonna try it and words are really hard. Do you have tips on how to do words? So I think finding a community and also just like participating in art calls and um, I think just getting your art out there. Yeah, you know, the, the thing is, I think we are really blessed with a huge artistic community in the Northwest. Um, well, when things open up again, um, there'll be more, but even now, even now there, there's just as Eileen has mentioned, there's community to be found um, and there's art to be seen. And it's very interesting because even with the pandemic, look what we're doing, you know, we're having an art event. So it doesn't stop, you know, I, I think it's beautiful that we're able to, gather, communicate, show work, even in spite of the pandemic. And in fact, I think one of the, the unexpected benefits are that people who would normally maybe not attend physically are able to attend now. So the thing is, uh, for anyone who is driven, and I say driven to create, then uh, it's incumbent upon you to discover, to just see what's available, to show up, and you'll be surprised what happens. Yeah. You will be surprised. Thank you for that, both of you. That's so amazing. I 
a couple more um, questions. Are, if both of you could, this is for both of you, are there any artists that influence the way you create your works that you might want to talk about? And that could be literary as well, knowing how much that's pulled in for both of you. Well, um, a major influence is Betty Saar. That's B-E-T-Y-E-S-A-A-R. Um, she mostly does assemblage, but um, I do a lot of collage, a lot of mixed media in the same vein. Um, there are just so many artists. Of course, Frida Kahlo, you know, is the goddess. <laughs> you know, um, there are just so many artists to, to name, but, but particularly, I, I would say Betty Saar was a major influence. And then, of course, on the literary end, you know, Toni Morrison, Lucille Clifton, they're just so many, you know, the thing is there are so many teachers, um, whether, you know, you take anything from their work that is um, instructional, it's, it shows you it is possible to be dedicated lifelong to art. And I think that's the major lesson to never give up on yourself, even if everybody around you says, well, why are you doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll share. Um, I really like um, this collective. It's a family collective from Boyle Heights in California, um, Cali Arte. Um, they are, I think, um, also self-taught, I think they do beautiful work with Lino Cut. They do a lot of um, visual representations of our community also. Um, and when I was first starting Lino Cut, I think they, they made me feel like this is something that you can do, you know, like your, your work is beautiful. And some of that validation, I think is important too, from other artists that you admire. Um, but I think I, I also love, you know, I've, I've taught Lino Cut to, um, middle school students in, at Centro de la Raza. And the, the artists that I shared with them, I just went on, on, on YouTube and found Oaxacan printmakers um, and showed the students, you know, people who inspire me, who use Lino Cut for political movements. And, you know, like these are all people who are also self-taught who have some similar backgrounds to them, right? And um, again, learned, self-taught taught themselves this, this medium and have used it in in the way that they live right to live i love all these questions thank you all uh, for submitting these I, there's one uh, here for eileen um thank you both for sharing your experiences uh, eileen i love your art so so much what do you think is the role that land, water, and space have in your art? And can you describe a little more about how that shows up in, in your pieces? There's a theme there. Yeah, I think recently I've been doing a lot of thinking and articulation around the role that as a displaced person, um, the responsibility that I have to this place, right? And, and really, thinking about what it means to be of this place, not in this place, right? So as someone who's indigenous to this continent is thinking about, again, the responsibility that, that, that I have to that, but really thinking about the dimensionality of that, like, I don't know, it feels so, I, I feel so connected to this land. And, and again, like the hands, like I think about the working of the land, right? So thinking about how, how the land belongs to us. How the land does not belong to us, but we belong to it, right? Um, and I think you will see that a lot um, in, in my work, but um, both in my artwork and in my professional work, um, and also just in the way that I lead in the community and things like that. Like for me, it doesn't feel separate. It feels all together. 
Thank you. Many thank yous and appreciation for sharing um, being with us tonight. I'm, I'm just so grateful. I don't want to end <laughs> this time. Um, I do have one more. Uh, Carletta, if you're down for one more. Um, Carletta, what are you finding inspiring right now in this cultural shift? Oh, I should ask for clarification. Are they referring to the artwork or? Shift. Yeah, I mean, you can answer both. I think wherever you feel comfortable, what's fine, what's inspiring to you. Oh, you mean, and do they mean in society? Is that what, is I that what they say? Yeah, cultural shift now. Well, you know what I think? What I think, it, it, it is such an amazing time. It really is amazing time. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think for the first time in history, mm -hmm. and I hate to use this kind of term, but well, all right, we're waking up and not just a small group of people. You, you don't have the luxury now to not look because in the before times you could, you know, go to plays, movies, you could, you could not look. But the gift of the COVID is that we're all called to pay attention for the first time because we're all in mortal danger. Now, some of us have been more in mortal danger all along since the inception of the country. But at this time, we don't have that luxury. So 2020 was. A, a year, I started with some friends, New Year's Eve. I had these owls, I had these beautiful owl napkins and talked about 2020 vision and how during this year we should see, we should look. And then the COVID hit. And, you know, I was like, well, wait, what happened? You know, I was thinking of the kind of inspirational 2020 vision, we'd be able to turn our heads like the owl and we would be able to see in all these directions. But then it occurred to me that actually that really was the gift because to have 2020 vision does not mean you see the Pollyanna view that you want to see, that all is revealed in a very stark way and you cannot look away. You can't just take a trip to another country and pretend that things are not happening. So when cultural shift, I wouldn't say cultural shift, it is our opportunity. And I don't think it'll come again. These are dire times. We have to look at what is happening to the earth, how people feel that they can murder someone and not get any accountability for it. So I think that the role of art and artists is to bring forward the visions and not only to bring forward the visions, to document the time. So I think it's a rich time. It's an ugly, beautiful, rich time to be alive. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Hmm. It's a beautiful night. I, I'm. Does it feel like we're we're through? Or are there any things that you want to share, Eileen or Carletta? I just thank you both so much for opening your heart and your art with us and speak forth this in this time it is a i thank you and i and i really enjoyed being paired with eileen and and hearing her story and learning about her her work um i wasn't aware of her so thank you yeah thank you so much for for all the work that you did to put this together and um I feel honored to to be able to share space with you, Carlotta. I feel like I can spend hours looking at each of your pieces. So thank you so much also for sharing so much of yourself with the world.
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you both. And thank you all for attending this event tonight and, and to our, our members and donors and the prison fund and looking forward to more art and more untold um, stories with you all we're we're in it together and i'm just so grateful for the art that we can talk about today and hear from artists today so um we'll see you next time and be sure to check out the BIMA website for more upcoming events and details on exhibitions and hopefully we'll be seeing each other in the galleries when we're all um, safe and um, yeah thank you both have a great night bye-bye